Hello YouTube! In previous videos I have shown how the authors of the Quran copied legends, fables, fairy tales and myths from different cultures and civilizations. The creation story of the Sumerians found its way into all three Abrahamic religions, where the splitting of earth and heavens was copied almost literally into the Quran and served as a basis for the Big Bang um, scientific miracle. I showed how Greek embryology was used as basis for the many human reproduction accounts. Endless stories from the two Bibles are found in the Quran. Since I looked into the Egyptian connection with Haman, I started chatting. But this time not with embryologists, but Egyptologists. And when you chat with Egyptologists, you get some amazing tidbits. Not just the obvious, like the construction of the pyramids, but also lesser known details. A.T. Kirk came up with this one and pointed out the various historical sources which he compiled into his in-depth German language video. Anyone who is familiar with the Abrahamic religions will surely know the story of how Moses led his people through the Red Sea. While we know today that none of this is historically accurate, but it is repeated endlessly and some adult humans actually believe this. The Quran does not stop where the conventional Jewish Bible or Old Testament stop, but goes a little further by adding some juicy bits and saying that the king of the Egyptians, the Quran calls Pharaoh, and saving him in his body as display for others to see. I can't get myself to say Pharaoh. I'll stick with the old-fashioned Pharaoh. This is then declared a scientific miracle, as Yusuf Estes, Zakir Naik and Harun Yahya copy, well, what a surprise, Maurice Bouquet, who asserts that he has identified the pharaoh or pharaohs in question and fabricates some assertions as proof that he was drowned. And this then serves as proof that this must have been the person mentioned in the Quran. It was actually discovered by a non-Muslim in the early 70s. He was one of the world's top surgeons and lecturers, scientists from France, Dr. Maurice Bukai. He was amazed because he said, we can prove that this person died of drowning. He was asphyxiated, meaning that his lungs filled with water and he died from this. Whoa, said, back up a little. No, there was no water in any lungs. None of them were found and buried near the sea. According to the legend, Moses was found in a basket and brought up at the Pharaoh's court. Which one? Well, the Quran does not say because the two Bibles don't say. Performing some mental acrobatics, some people come up with the name Ramses II, known as Ramses the Great. But this was a couple of hundred years ago when these people had no knowledge of forensics. Today we know full well that Ramses II died at a very high age of over 90 of so-called natural causes, i.e. a weak heart or a tooth infection, and was initially buried in the Valley of the Kings. He would never have been able to follow Moses for days standing on a chariot. So that leaves Mremta, his son. But he only reigned for 10 years, so could not have brought up Moses and, decades later, followed him. He died from a heart attack or a blow to the head, but not through drowning, and was also buried in the Valley of the Kings. Our good doctor is aware of this in the 70s, so he declares both pharaohs as being involved, the first being the one who brought up Moses and the second who wanted to kill him. Does the Quran say this? Nope. Bouquet declares Remta's cause of death as drowning. Does anyone agree with him? Nope. Does this fact stop any Muslim miracle seeker? No. Muslims even go on the offensive and cheekily claim that this is original and only found in the Quran. But is this true? Well, if you dig deep enough, you will find the entire raising the pharaoh as an example in older texts, delivering a remarkable match when compared to the Quran. If you read the various books of the Jewish Bible and extract the stories, the heroic deeds of Moses make for good campfire anecdotes. When the rod of Moses turned into a snake and ate the snakes the magicians of the pharaoh produced from their rods, it becomes very clear that all these stories are the typical my god is stronger and bigger than your god exaggerations. 
The same can be said about the devious destruction of the Egyptian army trying to get the poor Israelites back to Egypt. How fitting is it that the stories vary from campfire to campfire, and in one version everyone is destroyed by the just yet oh so merciful God, and in the next the head of the army is spared to set an example. So where does this second version with the spared Pharaoh come from? Well, all we need to do is look into the Jewish Apocrypha and the Chronicles of Nineveh. I was very surprised, and as we are all skeptics, also well, a bit doubtful of this possibility. Yet here it is, written by Jewish analysts. The happy ending here is most probably something different than what is encountered in massage parlors in Thailand, but the Midrash states that he, the Pharaoh, eventually ended up becoming the ruler of Nineveh, the city God sent Jonah to in order to pronounce its judgment. So our Egyptian ruler did not die along with his people after all? The story goes that Nineveh was doomed and Jonah averted the genocide by receiving mercy from his god. And so the pharaoh, having been drowned in the Red Sea, was picked up and brought to Nineveh. And how was Nineveh saved? Well, the pharaoh realized that Jonah was a prophet, ordered his people to repent and fast. God, in this case Yahweh, saw this and spared the city and the people of Jonah. The pharaoh remains a symbol of conversion, repentance and submission. So where are these texts? Well, we have the book of Jonah where the entire background story is told. And then a nice condensed version of the events is in the book of Jasher, chapter 81, where we see that not one man was left excepting Pharaoh, who gave thanks to the Lord and believed in him. Therefore, the Lord did not cause him to perish at that time with the Egyptians. And the Lord ordered an angel to take him from amongst the Egyptians, who cast him upon the land of Nineveh, and he reigned over it for a long time. The Midrash has the story, and the authors of the Quran copied it. Am I surprised? Nope. The Quran tells the story of saving of the Pharaoh in his body, which is told in 1092, and that of Nineveh in 1093 to 1098. So we have two books, both telling us the story of Israelites in Egypt who want to return to their homeland, the land of milk and honey. Both mention Moses, who is the spokesperson for his God and who relays the news about the killed babies and all the other atrocities that God comes up with. In my eyes, the best one is when God runs out of ideas what he can do to the Egyptians, he starts throwing frogs at them. Anyway, we have the entire Egyptian army follow the Israelites all the way to the coast, where the Egyptians are drowned in the returning sea which had been kindly split for the Israelites. And then we have Jonah who makes his people repent with the help of a king, who is the safe pharaoh from the Red Sea. Is there anyone who still doubts the parallels? There are many commentators who also see the duplicity in events in both books, but they are too numerous to mention here. So the claim by Muslim miracle seekers that this version is not in any previous religious text is unique and to the Quran is just a big fat lie. Oh, um, what is the name of the surah in the Quran where all this is found? Yunus or Jonah?